Andrew Russell, welcome to the Dylan Friends podcast, my friend. It's a, it's an honour, it's a pleasure, and very excited for today's chat. Good to be here, mate. The uh, the juggernaut that you've created, I hear. Uh, you said it, not me. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's a bit like yourself. We're both, uh, I think, experts in our own field. I like to say, um, yours took a lot more study, and I think it's a lot better than mine. But I'd like to compare us. Sometimes you feel like that's okay. Yeah, mate. I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever works for you, Dill. It doesn't. That definitely doesn't work. <laughs> um, mate, it's an honour to have you on the show. Um, just quickly as well, obviously Andrew Russell is your name, but you messaged me earlier, Jack, at the end. Does that mean that we're already friends? We're already on first name, nickname basis? Well, no, we are. We are. I mean, no, I, think, I don't think anyone calls me by my name anymore, except for mum. Why you know, is when it? I'm, when I'm yeah. in all sorts of trouble. Yes. Mum calls me, but apart from that, I'm, uh, I'm Jack Russell. And is that Jack just because of the what you think it is? Uh, yeah, well, pretty <laughs> sad. I, was, I think it was, uh, I was at Port Adelaide and uh, I think it might have been Brendan Laid. Uh, I'm just yapping around everywhere, you know, having a crack at everyone, bit of a short ass, just in everything, you know, make everyone's business my business and just Jack Russell stuck. So there you go. <laughs> it's fit. I think that could be a nickname for myself and I'm happy you've got it. Now, mate, um, Director of High Performance at Carlton FC. Obviously, you've had a, an incredible, um, illustrious career that's that's still going and it's going to go for a long time. Um and we're going to do a big chat today on your career, as we said. Obviously, you started at Essendon, Port Adelaide, massive bulk of that at Hawthorne, which was obviously very successful. But we could do a separate podcast down the track on your own sporting feats. Because I'm told you were Com Games. Untrue. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> nearly Com I Games. to be Com Games. You nearly got to the Com Games? Uh, yeah, well, I was like Stall a gift. national level sort of 1,500 metre runner in, in my day, a long time ago. Yep. Stall gift. I came second many times, could never win. So 1,500 metres, isn't the stall gift a sprint? Uh, yeah, it is, it is. No, but they have a whole range of events. They have, you know, 400, 550, you know, mile, you know, two miles. So the, uh, the mile. I you came, were in the mile run. I came second in the mile, the, one of the miles I had, but just couldn't get over the line. Mm, I'm very familiar with that. Uh, that's, that's fine, but you've done um, incredibly well now, mate. So moving on. Um, Obviously a high performance manager at, at Essendon and Hawthorne and uh, Port Adelaide and now at Carlton FC. Talk me through that journey because it's it's obviously such an incredible role to be, you know, at the at the highest form you are running the fitness programs at these clubs. How did you get there? Uh, yeah, interesting. I, I think um, it was, you know, around 20 years ago and the game was going through a real transition from semi-professional to professional at that time. So interesting story, I, um, I was running the draft camp, I was working at the Victorian Institute of Sport, um, driving the draft camp back in the day, the old Waverley, when Waverley was going in its tra- transition. Um, and uh, the head guy at Essendon of the tie, uh, uh, Loris Bertolacci, hurt his shoulder. He needed some, you know, needed some help within the fitness department. Kevin Sheedy walks in uh, to the draft camp. I'm the first fitness bloke he's seen. And he goes to someone, does that bloke know what he's talking about? And uh, that person said, I don't know, no idea, but he's running this, so he must be okay. He walks up and says, do you want a job? Um, so that's how, that's how it started. It was as simple as that. I'm not sure there was a lot of thought that went into it from Sheets, um, but that's what started it all. And sorry, what year was this? So that was, uh, that was 1998. So 1998. I, was, I, was still at, I was still at uni. Um, and I was, I was very fortunate I got a role at the Victorian Institute of Sport. Uh, I was working in sports science and strength and conditioning. Um, so, yeah, I, I was working there. Um, I was at Melbourne Storm doing, their, doing speed coach a um, couple of times a week with those boys. And then um, Essendon came along. So I thought, um, you know, why not? One thing that, that follows you is success. And um, that's, that's no coincidence. You, two years into that, you've, you've got your first taste of, of success at Essendon. So at that stage, were, was that your program or were, were you helping facilitate that program? No, jo- uh, well, well, Loris um, um, moved out. Um, John Quinn yep. came in. Um, so he was a, you know, he was a track coach. Um, it was a very different look for the AFL at that stage, John Quinn coming in. So, and he, he you know, he was, um, he was a really good motivator of people. Um, so you had Sheeds running a footy program. You had John Quinn running this conditioning program. And it worked really, really well. So I, I just I supported John. Um, interestingly, you know, you talk about all these experts coming in. John had never seen a game of AFL footy before he started. He literally, I, I walked into a cafe um, and he said to me, uh, can you draw the oval for me? And can you describe <laughs> the positions on the ground? I'm like, are you kidding me? This is my boss. Um, so 
we sat down and went through it, and you know, that's full forward. You know, I went down the line, he goes, geez, it's complex, isn't it? It's a big oval. That's a lot of ground they got to cover. Um, John went on, he had a great career. Um, he did a bloody good job, you know, with the Bombers. Um, so, yeah, then uh, I was there, 99 there, 2000, and um, Port Adelaide came knocking at my door. I was a young man, I was 23. I thought I knew a lot, um, and I've worked out since I didn't know much at all. But I threw my hat in the ring, and, you know, I, I had a crack. And I, I remember um, I was at the, uh, the best and fairest uh, at Essendon in 2000, and I had people coming up to me saying to me, what are you going to Port Adelaide for? What are you going over there for? Like, why would you go to a shit team like that? And at the time they hadn't been, you know, hadn't been great. Um, and I went over there and I watched their first training session. So just left Essendon, lost one game for that year. And I thought, oh my God, these blokes can kick a ball. They can, they can play. Like they were, it was an amazing group of players that I was just lucky enough, you know, to work with and walked into. It's, it's funny you say that, isn't it? Because I think in pre-season and, and the mix between fitness and footy, sometimes someone in your role can think too much about the um, the fitness side of things and then not worry about actually guys with skill and whatnot. You know what it's like sometimes you get really excited about what time someone's run early days. But I suppose has that been a big part of your philosophy isn't just fitness early days. It was always being able to be fit, but footy was the thing you had to do because I suppose the fitter you are, the better you can execute your skills anyway. Yeah, not like, no doubt it's been a really integrated approach. Um, I was really fortunate in the early days had Choco over there and, and Phil Walsh, you know, those two were, um, you know, were driving the program. Um, Dean Bailey comes in as assistant coach. Clarko comes in as assistant coach. you got Matty Randell. you got some amazing footy people over there and I learn a lot off all those guys about saying, well, this is, you know, this is a game of footy. It's not a running race. So early on, I worked with those guys to create a really collaborative footy program it's not really a conditioning program and a skills pro it's a really collaborative program we're working on everything together and you know like some of the guys over here and you talk about testing this time of the year well gavin wanganen didn't run over 200 meters in the four years i was there not once did he run one rep over over 200 meters why is that well because he wasn't very good at it yeah he was in a he was a explosive powerful animal and he had a bit of a chronic ankle injury that we had to manage so basically said he's not going to run anything long at all um and he didn't miss much training and he didn't miss many games and he played very, very good footy. So this whole, you know, you've got to do a shitload of running and big long miles and all this for footy is completely incorrect. Now, some guys can do it and, and the more they can do, the better they're going to be in terms of aerobic capacity. Does it make them better footy players? Sometimes, sometimes not. I hope you agree with what I'm saying here. But I think Gavin Wanganen is obviously a pretty good player, so it allows him to do whatever he wants, really. You know, he, that, we know that he's a Brownlow medalist. At that stage, I think he'd already crossed over and won one, so he might have that freedom to, to come over and probably know what he's good at. But for my example, um, and for maybe kids out there thinking about this, what do you say to someone who... Is it more important to focus on your deficiencies or more on your strengths? Because I know for a fact, like, I was, I was quite quick. That was my, my A1. But my whole career... All I worried about and focused on was trying to get fitter and then never focused on what I was good at. And it probably stuffed me in the end because I was never going to be the fittest bloke, but I was getting 60% better at that, but then losing probably 10% of my A1. Yeah, no, no, no doubt, make your A1 better. Like if you're, if you're a B plus at something, make it an A or make it an A plus because that's what allows, you know, talented people to play the game. They're, everyone's good at something. Bring that. You know, bring that out, what you're good at. Um, you know, there's been so much research around, you know, focusing on your strengths versus your weaknesses. And, I, and there's absolutely no doubt now that um, the jury's not out on that. You focus on your strengths um, and you support it with improving your weaknesses that, you know, if they're, if they're going to stop you playing the game, you've got to work on it. Like if it's genuinely you're not very good at something and if you don't get better, you cannot play the game, well, then you've got to work on it. But most of the guys in the AFL system – are good at something and we're all good at something, you know, so bring it to life. It doesn't matter what it is, you know, bring it to life. 2004, as you said, that's your, your first job where you're at the realm. You've won the, the flag. Um, how old were you? Because you said you got there at 23. So you would, would you have been 28? Uh, yeah, I was 27, I think, at the that, time. I feel like that's pretty young for a high performance manager, even back then. Oh, look, I, I was, I was extremely fortunate. You know, I, I, 
I worked really hard as a, as a young bloke. Um, you know, it, it, you know, a lot of people come into the system and say, well, how did you get here? What did you do? I said, well, I did a lot and I did a lot for nothing for a long time. Um, I'd travel anywhere I could around the country to go to any different program I could to see anyone who was, you know, anyone of, of, you know, with a good reputation um, or not, just to see how their programs run. Did they run a good program? Did they run a bad program? What made a program a really good program? I acted dumb for a long time mm. until I was in a position where people wanted to listen to me. And then obviously if you keep acting dumb, you don't go so well. So I started to think I've actually got to start pulling some stuff together and acting like I know something. So that was my world of Port Adelaide. I started to think, geez, I've got to, and these blokes are listening to me, you know, I've got to step up. So um, I had to develop some strong philosophies very quickly. Um, and, you know, and I had some, you know, like Choco and, and Phil Walsh challenging me immensely, you know, like genuine in your face, you know, quite intimid- intimidating humans, um, but great men, extremely supportive of me. And, they, you know, to be honest, Choco just backed me in, absolutely backed me in. And, uh, uh, you know, as did, you know, Clarko when I go to Hawthorne, he just backed me in and backed the program in. And, and you know, that's what the good coaches do and the good managers do. They back their people in. Yeah. And yeah, we're going to make mistakes, but they back them in. The, the, these control freaks out there, you, you watch their careers and they don't end up being there for the long term. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I've, I've, you know, I was in a system for eight years and saw a vast difference of lots of fitness people and coaches and the dynamic between of, you know, the teams. And if they're not intertwined and they're not working together, it just doesn't work. Um, in saying that, you said you've developed some, some strong philosophies then in 2004. Are they still similar to what you have now? Has it been sort of fundamentally, have you found something that you found work? Obviously, there's going to be ebbs and flows of, you know, new trends along the way, but are your philosophies similar the, the fun- way through? The fundamentals are so similar. And people have said to me, the game's changed and you must have changed and everything. It's just like, you know what? I haven't actually changed that much at all. Um, the basic philosophies of how to condition these guys are very similar. The big, the big change in the game and, and – um, really the thing that is the defensive action. So your accelerations or your decelerations in the game. So, the, you know, and a lot more sort of small-sided games, mini games, big games, um, you know, 5v5, 8v8, 12v12, 15v15. They, they suck. That's taken over the world. <sighs> um, you know, a lot of soccer stuff and hockey stuff and those sort of theories, that, you know, have come into the game, um, which is great. But... It's made it a different game. So that's the element that's changed. And so for a while there, you know, he had real issues with calves. You know, groins went up, uh, issues with calves went up, just conditioning to a different style of training. But we're well and truly, you know, past that. And, um, but you know, the, ga- the game, a- apart from that, the basic philosophies are very, very similar. When I go back to that saying they suck more in terms of they – have to be the hardest form of training I think you can you can do is those small sided games like the four on four eight v eight um, fifteen v fifteen in those small circuits because I think you would know more on this obviously but the theory on that is the work if you can work harder and closer together then the more room you've got the easier it'll be uh, yeah absolutely that's that's one part of it I mean the the big part of it is is executing skills in a fatigue state and and making the way you train harder than the game. So the most extreme situation you get into a game, let's go further than that and train that. So the game, elements of the game feel easy or they feel comfortable. Now we know it's a tough game um, and it's not an easy game and you know that better than me because you played it, I haven't. But, you know, you, you have to be, you know, you you got to be prepared to do that type of work to get better. But the, the issue is that guys can hide as well. You know, that uh, I don't think you would have been one of those guys deal. How can you hide these high? days with, with every GPS, every <laughs> every heart rate? I tried, but well, you can still you, hide. You can still hide out there. Is, but the then you ball, can't hide, you can't hide post. 000. Yeah, that's true. They for that finds you out. Yeah, yeah, that's well that's where I'd, I would get found out. This time of year, obviously as we said earlier, we've touched on a lot, it is a it is a tough time of year. Um, not so much in, in twenty twenty or or anything specific, but what is a preseason like for the general person out there, and from your point of view, because I think we were chatting before off air, it's it's probably different from even a high performance manager to a player because this time of the year is honestly one of the most stressful times for a player coming back from a break. You don't know where you're at. You're doing time trials, um, you know, skin fold tests. You're getting poked and prodded everywhere to make sure you've come back in good condition. 
why is that? And is it just so that we're in good nick or is it more to set a fo- good foundation for, for the the team and the year ahead? Well, I was, uh, we had a bit of a um, 2008 um, Hawthorne Premiership catch-up um, last weekend and I caught up with a few of the boys and Stephen Gillam, defender, he said to me, the most nerve-wracking day I had all year, more nerve-wracking than grand final day was coming back to train. The night before <laughs> was the worst sleep I ever had. And so, well, so true. Uh, well, I think, um, I mean, we haven't even tested this year. Um, we will, and that's not a big part of our program, um, you know, and what's the value of testing really? It's just saying, well, where am I at? Um, am I where I should be at? And it's a form of motivation really. But um, there's a whole lot of different tests we do as well. The old 2K test, that's good for some guys and it's the worst possible test for others. You know, I remember, I remember years ago I changed it, you know, Cyril Rioli was running you know, almost last, and I'm thinking, and he used to look at me like, what am I doing this for? Yeah. This is rubbish. I don't play this way, so why the hell should I run a 2K? It's well, ridiculous. Um, so he'd actually lose confidence. So I'm saying well, anything that I do that makes an athlete lose confidence is wrong. It's just wrong. Now, you can – people justify it different ways, but it's bullshit. Um, so change it. Or make it – it doesn't mean that you don't challenge them. It doesn't mean you don't test them. But do something that's more specific to that type of player and the way that he plays. Because there's only – they can only become so good aerobically. You know, there's a limit. You know, you can't make these guys – if they start right down to the left and they're terrible, well, you can bring them up, you know, along, you know, the spectrum a little bit. But you're not going to make them aerobic animals, you know, by the end of it. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so but I, I think the big reason is just the, uh, the uncertainty. You know, people, people don't go well with uncertainty. So you've been training by yourself. You're not really sure how hard you've been going. You know, you, you might have been training one or two guys. Um, we're social animals in, an, a, in any footy club or any club. When you haven't been part of that club for a while, all you've been doing is thinking about yourself in the off-season. You come back and you think social comparison takes over. Where am I in relation to the boys? I don't want to stand out. Mm. So I don't want to stand out as in I don't want to be shit, but – some of them also have, I don't want to stand out because I don't want to be better than everyone. That's also in some athletes' mind. Now, some of them just think, oh, I'm going to come back and kill everyone, and that's, that's great. But often, um, most athletes and most people just want to be somewhere comfortable in the middle and just want to hide. That's what most people want. That's where their mind is comfortable. Yep. Not too far back, not too far forward. Yep. And what do you say to your players about that, to come back? No, we want to come back in. We want to come back in your best, your best possible yeah. physical shape. That's not the best running capacity you've ever been in. And for me, it's about um, body shape, body composition, just being in really good health, physically and mentally, being really good health. So we, you know, we want these guys to have you know really different, unique experiences in the break. You know, obviously they can't do it at the moment, but go somewhere around the world that you've never been before, meet new people, do new things, come back with a completely different you know perspective. You know. One of the trips that we went on at Hawthorne, we went to South Africa, you know, a completely different culture. It was the most amazing trip, you know, a most amazing trip. The, the, the first thing when we get there, got there, and we didn't really plan it this way, but it ended up being extremely smart, was they just won um, the first of three and we went to South Africa the next preseason and we went into a training camp um, out of Johannesburg that was set up for the World Cup, for the Soccer World Cup. That was previously there for you guys and we were in a compound and because south africa had you know some issues at the time um with safety yep you had to go into this compound that had a barbed wire around the whole thing all right so we went in there and we're there for four days and the players just looked at me like you are kidding me what are you doing what are we doing this for <laughs> we've gone the other side of the world to train in a compound we could have just done that at home but what it did was because they couldn't go anywhere, they couldn't do anything, they'd been living these individual lives, doing whatever they wanted, going everywhere, you know, partying, whatever, it reset them again to say, you know what, that's gone, it's done, you've won a premiership, great, who cares, move on. You know, this is about the now. And you guys have got to get in good shape and good, good in shape really quick. So let's get fair income again. So four days almost like reset them. And that's what good athletes do. They reset really quickly. You know, they might have lost their way a little bit. They might have had a good time, whatever. But they reset and then we opened out and we travelled around and we had, you know, an unbelievable, you know, experience over there. That's incredible. I, I couldn't agree more. I think those off-season trips and, and getting locked in together, um, not necessarily with barbed wire, but, you know, in a facility is good. Um, barbed wire might add to it a little bit more. I'm sure it would. <laughs> um, one thing I think in your industry, and I, I suppose people – 
uh, outside the industry wouldn't understand is how important your role is. And if you don't have someone like yourself that knows what they're doing, then you, you, your team's not going to be winning any flags and it's not going to win any games. Um, history's shown over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, and, and you'd know this, and I know it's hard for you to say because it's it's yourself, but realistically, if you don't have a good high-performance manager and a team around you that keeps players fit out on the park, then you don't win premierships. And, and the teams that have done that the best over the last 10 years have won the flag at the end of the day. How, I suppose, going to Hawthorne now, because it was consistently done for a long time, how do you think you did that? I'll, I'll simplify it as yeah. much as I can. Um, there was a fantastic team of people there and I was part of that team. You had, um, you know, guys like Peter Wickwee, Michael McDesey, the doctors, just outstanding humans, number one, very good doctors. Um, Andrew Lambert, head physio, he's been there, you know, the whole time The clark has been there. Um, so consistency, uh, you know, people. Uh, we had um, We had two footy managers during that time. You have one coach during that time. So for me, within a footy department, your high performance guy, your doctor, your head physio, head of footy, head coach. Stability in those areas where you just know each other backwards. So um, you come in, uh, you come into a training session, I have a chat to you about something. Um, within a couple of minutes, I talk to the coach about it, I talk to the doctor about it, I talk to the physio about it. We are all on the same page. You walk out, you walk out on the training track, you go out there training, you're half an hour in, the coach goes up to him, or goes up to you and says, Dill, uh, mate, this is what I'm thinking, uh, this is what I want you to do. And you're like, Jesus, Jack just told me that half an hour ago. And then the, then the doctor goes up to him after training and says, mate, I saw what you did out there, I liked what you did. That was really impressive. It's just like, God, he knows what I'm doing as well. Like they're all saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, so that consistency of message, if you've got to deal with stuff, deal with it straight away, have the hard conversations, move on, you know? So who's important? Uh, who do you get in? Who do you bring in, you know, to that inner sanctum to make decisions, make decisions based on what's best for you as the athlete. Uh, it's not, you know, so sometimes the doctor is the one, the smartest bloke in the room. Sometimes it's the physio, sometimes the coach, sometimes it's the, the player's manager. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes, you know, who knows? Mm. Who cares? Whoever's got the best idea and, has got the best interest of that player that's what we do how because i've again i'm not sure what, how this worked at hawthorne or in past but how robust do some of those conversations get between yourself doctors coaches development coaches managers all these people together trying to work out what the best thing is for a certain circumstance how and again like you said it's because if there's good relationships and there's respect there when it works but how you know big can these conversations get about certain topics I think it's as robust as you could ever imagine. So think about the most robust conversation you've ever had, ever heard of or know about, and it goes there. It doesn't go there very often because if it goes there a lot, like relationships start to break down. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I, I remember I was in a meeting one day and um, Alistair Clark's daughter happened to be sitting there. It was very rare and she was just sitting in the corner doing some stuff and Clark and I were going at each other about something and um, – uh, his wife's got a really good relationship with, with my wife and um, she texted her after it. Her daughter had said to her, I'm not sure those two are going to be able to talk to each other again. Like, I don't know how they do it. But you move out of that room, bang. Two minutes later, we're good, good mates, move on, bang. It's like nothing ever happened. You just have to, you have to compartmentalise it, go hard, know that the passion is there to get the best result for the program, the player, whoever. So if that passion's there and it's real, you can have those conversations. Yeah. With Hawthorne and I suppose your team there and something that I suppose you'd be a lot are really proud of and I, I know that this is really well known that you guys have done incredibly well was getting players from other teams and that, that they'd come with historically injuries and being able to turn them around and get them fit and get them going. Because I know how hard that can be because I was actually on the other side of that in terms of I was quite, you know, I'd, I'd had injuries when I was playing my first club. But moving clubs, when you're so used to a set program... I didn't realise how hard it was to transition into a new one and I just broke down through injury. So what and how strenuous is your philosophy on that in terms of getting new guys in, tailing programs and fixing them? Guys like Sean Burgoyne, um, Cyril Rioli with his hammies. Um, there's probably a lot more there that I'm, I'm missing out on. Yeah, they say, you know, Josh Gibson came in with Gordon's. David Hale had a bad hit. Brian Lake with his knee, had a shocking knee. Um, 
yeah, there's 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 lots of guys. Um, uh, look, I'd say firstly we were we were comfortable with taking a risk. Um, we knew what we were getting into, so we knew what we were getting. Um, when they got there, there was nothing worse than getting a player. It's just like, geez, I didn't know he had that and that and that. And, you know, all the little tricks that uh, players keep up their sleeve about. I don't tell you. They don't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that. Um, so, but I, I, the, uh, we had a lot of trust from the players that were already there. Um, we had really high standards from the players that were already there. The culture was really strong around trust these blokes and don't go off and do your own thing. So guys like Hodge and Mitch and these guys would just say, no, no, back these blokes in. Um, Clarko gave us a huge amount of autonomy he just said just get them right don't want to see them in the program until they're right so yep. don't break the rules don't get them back quick don't just do it well so Sean Burgoyne comes in and he says I don't care if he doesn't play till halfway through the year so he's come in on you know good contract big player and the coach just says if he doesn't play till the middle of the year that's okay so just go to work but just get him right you know, so, in. and then that, uh, go back to that, um, your doctor, your physio, strength and conditioning guys, you know, working really, really well together with, you know, with people backing them in, your footy manager and your coach and others around the club just saying, so that sense of not having a rush and just doing the basics, you know, Jager was another one, yep. O'Meara. Um, so, yeah, it's not that complex, but it's hard to do in this environment because everyone's in a rush Everyone thinks it's the most important game you're ever going to play. It's the most important training session you're ever going to do. If they're not out there, you can't get them back. You know, it's just like, just do the basics well. Being in your role over your career, who are some of the players that stand out the most in terms of athletic ability where you've just been like, shit, that was, this bloke is, male, female is just too far gone. He's he's too good. Uh, Yeah, well, there's different elements of, athleticism in there um look i think um buddy would be number one and i know he's a great footballer but in terms of athletic ability he's the one that stands out in terms of just being able to do things that others couldn't because uh he was quick he was strong he had good endurance um you know he could change direction he could jump in the air he did some stuff that you know especially you know that 2007 to 11 12 period that was pretty damn special. You come to training, you think that guy is the best guy. If you'd never watched the game, you never knew anything about the game, you'd say, who is that bloke there? His, his ability in a handball game to just demolish everyone, you know, like you're right in close, you just run through guys. He'd push off, he'd smash past them and he'd just keep doing it the whole time. Like he was on another level physically to other guys. Um, you know, early days, um, a guy, Michael Wilson at Port Adelaide, he was a defender an absolute animal. He's a physio now um, and physio Port Adelaide. He was a beast. You know, we did a session one day. We did uh, we did three sets of uh, three sets of four one fifties on the running track. Um, I was ridiculously aggressive early days in what I threw at the Port Adelaide players. So on a Monday morning, we'd start our week with a repeat speed session on the track, and then we'd go and do skills in the afternoon, and just went from there like it was crazy. Two or three sessions a day. Um, all the midfielders, we did a touch footy competition on Tuesday nights. So that was the third running session they did for the day, like crazy stuff. Anyway, Michael Wilson did this session. Um, he was so physically exhausted, he couldn't drive home. I had to ring his wife to come and pick him up, to drive him home like a, a beast physically, but strong. Um, you know, he had multiple knee reconstructions, Achilles ruptures, shoulder reconstructions, just kept coming back from him. Um, he was injured. He had, a, he had a shoulder injury going into the 204 final series and I think it might have been I think it was between seven and eight weeks he couldn't drive his car for the first three days after a game that's how much pain he was in with his shoulder he, he there's hardly another player in the competition that would have played he played for eight weeks and at the time the coaches regarded him as in the top three or four players you know in the team wasn't a huge name but hugely important you know to to that team so um yeah look there's there's you know there's so many guys over the years you know t- timmy clark was just an unbelievable runner yeah you know like just covered you know i got Croft at the end of his career um he just wanted to do speed work all the time you know it's just like he i'm gonna lose my speed i'm gonna lose my speed you know, i'm getting older i'm getting older i'm getting older stop sprinting Croft. and just turn around i'd say mate don't want you to sprint i turn around there he's on the track doing another sprint it's just like mate it's gonna kill you um anyway he got to kill you sorry he had uh, patella tendon issues and you know Round 12 that year, 08, you know, those who followed the story, basically couldn't kick over a jam tin, 
couldn't rub above 60 percent he was gone i remember going into club and said mate he's he won't play another game he's done um and he ended up getting through and he ended up actually going pretty well and ended up playing a grand final which i just can't believe he did even to this day i don't know how he got there rest is what i want to get into next with you because i know this is a massive massive part of your you know iq and and your philosophy and knowledge around around sport and how important rest and recovery is and that is is sleep talk us through i suppose how important it is and and how did you come about this early was it something that you always knew or was it something you found throughout your career that to, to get the edge yeah, well, I think the, the research on sleep has improved significantly over the last, you know, 15 years. What we now know a lot and we didn't know, you know, 15, 15 20 years ago. So um, it's been out there, but, um, I, you know, I think that um, I was always, I grew up an athlete um, and I knew growing up innately that I just couldn't train unless I had really good sleep. And I was obsessed about being a good athlete. Now, you know, I didn't become great, doesn't matter, but I wanted to be good. Um, but I just knew how important it was. So I was so self-driven around doing that. No one needed to tell me. So I had a sort of a thirst for it early around, I'm just not going to compromise on that. And then I started pushing it with the athletes that I work with. Um, and I started seeing athletes just change quite significantly. The guys that slept well and the guys that didn't, just their consistency the consistency of energy number one their mood you know how how um you know how just up and about they were um and their ability to deal with high training lights so i was doing the experiment without really knowing the science and then the science sort of came from everywhere and it's just like well that makes so much sense to me you know now that the science is out there and you know, if you want to be a good athlete, so let's talk about growth hormone. You know, all these young boys talk to me about wanting to get bigger and stronger and more endurance and everything. But if you really want to, then understand things like, you know, between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., there is a significant amount of growth hormone that's released at that time. So uh, that's what they call the money time in terms of growth hormone, all right? So if you choose to go to bed at 11, 11.30, you're missing out on 25%, 30%, 40% of that growth hormone release. So you want to be a good athlete? Go to bed at 10, 9.30, 10. Um, and, and then you've got to think about, well, so there's, there's, there's the physical side of recovery. So tissue regeneration is huge. And then there's the psychological element of recovery. So basically what happens um, within a night, we, we have these cycles, these sleep cycles. We want as many sleep cycles as we can over that period where we go to bed. Um, the more sleep cycles you have, the better recovered you are. Now, early on in the night, it's actually more around the physical recovery. Um, and then interestingly, as you go later on in the night with this thing called uh, REM sleep, um, and that is where you get your psychological recovery. So um, that is where you all, all, everything that you learn during the day, basically we get smarter at night. We don't get smarter during the day. We get smarter at night because all that information is digested, retained, and then goes into our brain into long-term memory. Um, but also the other fascinating thing about REM sleep, so that we're talking, you know, the sleep you get between 3 and 7 a.m., or that type of sleep there, is how you deal with life is much better when you get better quality REM sleep. So how you deal with stress, how you deal with people, people, people become, uh, they become irritating, you know, without, they get irritated easily, they don't deal with stress as easily and they don't respond to other people as well. So they just, you know, people get shitty mm. much quicker, uh, much quicker with people. So, um, you know, and, and so eight hours isn't eight hours. It depends on what eight hours during the night you get as to which part of that recovery. And, and so, you know, it's all, all really important. So how, how do we get better sleep then? If we've, we, are we guaranteed to hit a REM cycle every night? Well, one of the things you don't get as much REM is when, um, when you drink alcohol, for instance. See, so that, was, that was something that I really wanted to talk to you about today because after a game, and I think this is a massive one that players, hopefully they don't do anymore, and I used to do, was every night after a game or even some nights still, after a long week, I go, shit, I'm so fucking tired. I'm just going to have a glass of wine, a couple of glasses of wine so I can go to sleep. But that's the worst thing I could probably do. Probably. You could have been anything, Dill. You could still come back, mate, I reckon. Yeah. Between You're not the sleep, only one who thinks that. Between yeah. sleep and alcohol. <laughs> you reckon I you might still sleep. make it. Yeah, okay. There's still a chance. Yeah. Um, oh, look, so the big, I mean, the, one of the most, you know, when people are trying to change, uh, 
a habit and improve their sleep, one of the things they talk about is the 10, 3, 2, 1 rule. All right. So um, no caffeine for 10 hours before you go yeah. to bed. Then we've got three hours is no food or alcohol, two hours technology. So the phone, so the blue light in the phone is no good. It's basically you think about you're stimulating the brain waves you shouldn't be stimulating. Um, and then one hour um, is TV. Now that's very extreme. Even if you halve that, you know, that would be extremely beneficial. I mean, ca- caffeine's huge. Caffeine's got a half life of six hours. So when you have, if you have 100 milligrams in your coffee, then six hours later is 50, six hours after that is 25, six hours after 12 and a half. So if you have a coffee in the morning and a coffee at night, you've always got caffeine in your system. It will never, ever get out of your system. Um, so, you know, certainly talk to the players about not having caffeine after lunch, you know, that it's, that it's there in the morning. Um, that, that's a huge thing. Um, sleeping in a dark room because your eyes pick up the light and that sends a message to your brain to sleep lighter or to wake up. So that's really, really important. Um, already talked about the technology, um, 19 to 20 degrees, all right, temperature in your room has been the, the number that they've been researched to be, to be optimal. Um, and whereas a lot of us in summer, we sleep too hot and in winter too cold, you'd rather be too cold yep. than too hot. Um, the other thing about sleep is just getting into a routine. It's like anything, getting into a sleep, talk about sleep hygiene or sleep routine that you have these expectation effects that your brain knows that if you eat at that time, you then go and have a shower at that time, you do your teeth at that time, your brain is that sophisticated that it knows that that routine of events leads to sleep. So, but if you do all these different things, if one night you're doing this, the next night you're doing something out and you've got all these different routines and all these different habits and behaviors before you sleep, your brain says, I don't know what you're doing. You're throwing me into disarray. I've got all this different brain activity happening and I'll make you suffer by not going to sleep or not getting into deep sleep as deep, quickly. Deeper sleep, yeah. So it's, yeah, it, look, it's fascinating, but, you know, really got to work hard on those sleep routines to maximize, maximize your sleep. Eight hours is obviously what, is that, the, is that the key money? Is that the money hour that you want to be getting? Well, I don't think there's, uh, look, I think that sleep is very individual how much sleep we need, but I think there's no doubt that you need at least seven if you're going to be a high level, you know, a high level performer over time. Yeah. You can function at a high level with a lack of sleep for a period of time, but it eventually gets you. And where, and where it might not get you from a, so if you're an athlete, it will get you absolutely without doubt because you are exerting, you need so much physical energy to produce that effort that you get found out. You make a decision not to do it. I think if you're not an athlete, you can still get away with it and still function at a high level, but where it gets you at some stage is just, is your health. At some stage, your body will break down and you will have a health issue of some description because regeneration is so important, whether you're an athlete or not an athlete. At a cellular level, cellular health is so important. So if you're breaking down cells, you are going to be putting yourself in a position of you know, ill health. And I, I talk to people now around, um, you know, you know, people are saying, yeah, but everyone's living longer and living these, you know, long lives. And so, yeah, yeah, people are living longer. But this concept of, of uh, health span versus disease span. So how much of that 80 years is quality versus how much of that 80 years do you break down and have some sort of health issue where the last 30 or 40 is an absolute disaster? Yeah, you're living, but are you really living? So this is this, this concept of how you want to make that health span as long as you possibly can, all right, and it's what you do in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, it's even what you, even you do in your teenage years that actually helps you live a longer and healthier life. Um, I mean, the habits, any habit that we create, we create habits in our teenage years, that's where they're most, most powerful. So any habit that you create during your teenage years, you've pretty much got for life. So the good ones, that's great but you've also got the shit ones that you've got to deal with. So then you've either got to make a decision or how do I actually get out of that habit, break that habit and start a new one. That is so much more challenging. So when we get the young boys into the footy club, the guys that actually haven't got a lot of strong routine, strong behavior, strong habits, they're the ones that I really like to work with or the ones with really good, strong habits. Like, mm-hmm. a, you know, Sam Walsh comes in and he's just a jet. Like he yeah. knows what it's about. His habits are elite already. He just knows what it is for him and he does it. Um, but 
I'd much rather a guy that hasn't developed them than a guy that comes in with really poor habits because it's really hard to break habits. It's possible and we could do it, but geez, you've got to be really switched on, passionate and want to do it. So athletes, obviously, we're, you need to sleep to break, to, to recover, obviously. But there's the general public out there that will be listening to this now and I'm, I'm in that now and I want to get my sleep too because I, I know that if I have a good sleep and I get up early, so I've, my rule around sleep, Nora, is that I have to get up before 7 a.m. Otherwise, I feel crap throughout the day. So that just mean that then if I just have to go to bed earlier to then get up at 7, if you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Short sense. Yeah. But then in saying that as well, how can someone that isn't, you know, competing every day, you know, exhorting all their physical energy, how can someone sleep better if they're not light sleepers? Because that's the thing that I'm probably – focusing now i spoke to my mum the other day and she she's a terrible sleeper and she said to me that she she hasn't slept well for for 10 years and you know she works hard she she just doesn't get into deep to deep sleeps is there a way or tips to anyone out there who can get into more sleeps or, or a deeper sleep to be able to hit those REM cycles uh what well, you'd have to know their individual it, situation break so it down. you'd have to break it down and know but 101 well 101 wrong 101 is the routine yeah. having a really strong routine um, and almost like the 10, three, two, one, yeah. you know, like if you want to, yeah. if you want to change something, sometimes you've got to go to extremes to change something. And that's why changing any habit is, you know, you really got to go to extremes, you know, to change anything because your body will fight it. So you might, if she normally goes, um, to bed at 11, 11, 30, if she starts going to bed, you know, at nine thirty or 10, she might actually feel worse before she feels better mm. because that's normal. Anything you change in your life you will feel worse before you feel better. And that's why most people give up because they think stuff this, not worth it. I actually feel worse. What's the point? And it's at about that three week mark where you sort of break through three or four week where you, you know, any habit you change, you actually start to feel better for it. But most of us don't get there. 21 days is a normal sleeping habit routine, isn't it? To be able to stick into something. Yep. What happens then then for say there's a guy, right? His name's Billen, for example. And he sleeps well on Monday to Friday. But then Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, he stays out late and he has some beers with his mates. Yep. What happens then? Is there a way to, even though, look, that's it's probably not good that you're doing that anyway, but realistically in life that's going to happen. Is there a way to combat that and somehow still get good sleep in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, the biggest mistake that, uh, what's his name? The, the Billen. Billen. Billen, yeah. Billen, he's yeah, a mate of yours. He's a friend of mine, yeah, he's a good guy. Um, so, too. so Billen says, I've got to get eight hours. Yeah. So he gets home and he thinks I'm going. So that's the first mistake he's made because Billen gets up and he thinks, oh, I feel shocking. So he's overslept. It's like being jet lagged. So we, we basically, um, we're designed to do the same thing every day. So we love the same thing. So we should be going to bed within an hour and getting up within an hour. That's like the optimal, if you were thinking optimal. So he gets home 4 a.m. And uh, he really should be saying, well, all right, I'm going to get three or four hours. I'm going to get up within maybe an hour, an hour and a half of my normal time. So I'm actually going to get, I normally get up at seven. I'm going to get up at eight. So all right. The sleep-ins are, shouldn't be doing No sleep-ins. Yeah. No good. Or, sorry, you can have a small sleep-in. An sleep hour. In, an hour. Know, an hour. Yeah. If we're going to extremes, go to the hour. Yeah. Then after lunch, you could have an hour you know, get an hour sleep in. Then that night, if you, you know, if it's just a one-off, it's one night, then go to bed an hour earlier the next night. Um, and then over the next few nights, he might just go to bed an hour earlier and he makes up for it. So by Wednesday, he's feeling pretty good again. And, and the example, the greatest example I've got is that is you know, Hawthorne in uh, 2015, all right? We, we went to Perth uh, three times in seven weeks, all right? And 80% of the players came back on the red eye. So gave them a decision and said all right boys how do you want to live your life what's the best scenario for you some wanted to stay over but not many um some wanted to come back all right so number one they make the decision of what they want to do so therefore if they make decision they'll make it work versus if i had told them you are coming back on the red eye they're like hang on a minute this bloke's making how does he know what's best for me but they end up making that decision anyway so they come back on the red eye and exactly that get home some blokes got home six o'clock in the morning so they played a game friday night saturday morning you get home so the flight leaves what at midnight or whatever mm. it leaves you get home and exactly that go to bed have three or four hours get up have an hour sleep in the afternoon and then you're getting it back 
over the next three or four nights. So by Thursday, say by Thursday, we want to have our energy back. Um, you know, we played uh, we played West Coast first final, got absolutely belted. All right, um, first mistake we made was we had business class seats on the way over, um, so the boys were feeling pretty good about themselves. So we got smashed. So we never did that again. Um, got back. By Thursday, we didn't train that hard Tuesday at all. By Thursday, they were jumping out of their skin, all right, because we gave them recovery. We didn't have them in early at the club that day, but early enough, like not too late either. So they were sleeping in. Um, they played Adelaide in that final. You know, first quarter is one of the best first quarters you'll ever see. Like completely dominated that game. Then have to go back and play Fremantle. So go back again. No business class this time. Only cattle class this time. We did business class on the way home, not yep. the way over. Changed our strategy a bit. Um, same thing. We come out next week, West Coast, 32 degrees, played an amazing game of footy. Do you think that now, like I don't think that there was ever an emphasis on on sleep as much in in any of the teams that I was playing with. Was that something that was pretty niche to Hawthorne at that time and still is? Uh, or do you think teams I, are catching on now? I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't really bother me what other people do. I yeah. just worry about what I do and worry about what us. So, you know, right now I'm just I worry about what the Carlton boards are doing. You know, what the Carlton players are doing, it's complete focus on them and what the rest of the world do. They make their choices and they do what they do and, you know, that's up to them. You look back uh, at, at everything you've done and everything you've achieved and you're still so young in, in this space, very young, and there's still so, so, so much to achieve. What, where do you see the industry going next? Like, is, it, is there still so much to improve? Because I still feel that, like, every year going into pre-season, there was something that was always sort of groundbreaking. You know, it used to be ice baths, then it was actually hot baths for a while, then it was intermitting both in together. Um, now there's obviously a lot more, you know, you were onto it early, but sleep's a massive thing now that people are running into. Is there always going to be these new sort of trends that are coming through? And... Where does agreeability come into that? And then when does your own theories come into that? Because I know I was chatting to Sam off air and I said, as someone just maturing now and, and not to do with sport, but just in life, I'm very agreeable. I don't really question things enough. Like I think theories that people have, I'll go, oh, cool, okay. Like I'm just going to believe you. everything you said, I'm just going to believe. But then I think there's a point of where you, you read these things and these theories that come up and I know that you're good at this now and it's going – well, this guy in Germany thinks that this is good for sport, but do I think it's good? Does that come across your desk a lot? Uh, yeah, it does, but not as much as you might think. The basics have been the basics for ages. You know, the fundamentals are the fundamentals and they'll always be there. So if you look at, you know, the way you, you, know, the way you train, how smart, knowing your athlete, getting them to know themselves, you know, when do you train, when do you rest, how long do you rest for, you know, the fundamentals are the fundamentals. And I don't think there's as much new stuff as everyone thinks. I think they talk it up. I think they come up with this. They hear one thing, they run with it. Someone says, yeah, I did that. It's a great story. But most of the time it's bullshit, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Fantastic. Last thing I want to touch on, because I know you're a busy man, is, is the health, healthy mind platter. Um, I know it's something you like to speak about a, a bit, and it, it, we could talk about this for hours. But but what what is this and how, how does it work? The biggest part of it, and, um, you know, T Tara Kavanagh, um, you know, the psych at Carlton is very, very good in yep. space. And, you know, there's there's quite a few elements of there it. There is. I've got them uh, here. I wrote them down because I couldn't remember them. But there's, uh, sl it, there's seven types of time. Sleep time, physical time, focus time, time in, downtime, play time, connecting time. Yeah, well, let, um, let's not – I mean, you could talk about it for a long time, but obviously we've talked about the sleep time and the, and the physical time. We yep. know – I mean, the benefits of exercise are, are huge um, on, you know, just about every system in the body. You know, they're, they're, and people now uh, – you know, you go to the doctor now and everyone looks for a, a pill, some sort of medication to make them better. But, you know, and in a lot of cases, especially early on, we can help ourselves. We can help ourselves with – all doing all these really good practices, how well we eat, you know, reducing free radicals in our body, you know, exercise, reducing blood pressure, you know, uh, you know, reducing, you know, your, you know, your ability to get, you know, cardiovascular disease and, you know, insulin sensitivity and all these things. There is so much that we can do ourselves before we go to the pill, you know, something to fix it. We can fix ourselves yet 
a lot of us don't know and some of us are too lazy and can't be bothered and just want a quick fix. But anytime you put something in your mouth, there's got to be a downside to that somewhere. Yep. You know, it, there just has to be somewhere. So um, a big part of the uh, Healthy Mind Period um, is um, connection. You know, connect that connecting. We are, you know, people that love connection. And, you know, there's things called mirror neurons, you know. So right now we're connecting at some level, you know, through these mirror neurons through our brain. So um, I, I say something, you think that sounds okay, you go with it, you know. Now some of your mates, all right, so let's just put it this way, you know, when you're with UW, you've got a large number of mates, all right, from what I know. couple. couple of mates, couple. all right. A couple of crazy eggs couple of really straight eggs yep when you're with the straight eggs you're acting straight you're with them and you might be a bit out there but basically you're doing what they do all right when you're with the crazy eggs you're a little bit more down to the right thinking that sounds pretty good i'll do that just because that's what they're doing so we all connect and we just respond to each other so if you've got a good culture a shit bag is going to be pretty good all right and if you've got a bad culture a shit bag is going to be a shit bag yeah. Right in that culture, you can have people just change, and they might be a shit bag there, and they're really good here. So they might leave the club and be no good, but at the club they're beautiful. You know, they do everything we want them to do. So that sense of connection, we want to connect, we want to feel part of something. So that's why we change our behaviour to fit in with whatever that person is doing or whatever that group is doing. So, but connection is just everything you know in our world, and connection reduces stress. You know, so stress. You know, all this comes down, all that healthy mind platter comes down to reducing stress you know in our life and if you look at the reasons you know the the major reasons for stress um from the research um and not in any order but one is you just you just haven't got your life parts of your life in order so your relationships your finances your training your education your whatever there's some element of that that's not in order now you don't have to get it in order to reduce your stress but your intent has to be to get it in order so you might not actually change it but you've got to work hard to change it hmm. we get stressed when we can't you know but when we do nothing procrastination is a huge huge reason why we get stressed well, it's so um, true because you can be stressed but then you can be stressed and have a plan you feel better about it because at least you can see then that there's something there's a way out changes the hormonal profile so it changes your mood you know all this is about changing mood and how you feel about yourself there's not a player I know hasn't changed their diet and had a higher quality diet that doesn't feel better about themselves as a person. Forget about the athlete and running faster or jumping or hitting that pack harder. They just yeah. feel better. It's more in about the, the mental wins. The, the human connection. When we don't have human connections, we struggle. So COVID, great example. Some people living by themselves, lack of connection, couldn't see friends. A lot of issues all right, with mood and how they felt about themselves because they just lost that connection. You know, We were forced to lose connection for a period of time. Um, uh, other things are when we do when we do behaviour that is you know a thing we call instant gratification. So we do something that makes us feel great, but we know it's not good for us. Mm. There is a stress response to that later on, and the other one's time pressure. You know, and some of us have it, some of us don't, but we a lot of us are feeling just under pressure to get shit done in the day. That, that's I agree with all of them, and I think that the last one on time pressure I actually think is a positive for me because I'm probably under the impression and i suppose it's how you read it and what you get out of it but time pressure for me is actually a good thing because if i'm not under pressure i don't perform so but you love it I, the next person doesn't. i actually no i actually hate it but i just know it's good for me yeah yeah yeah. so yeah. I, I don't like being under pressure but i know if i'm not feeling it then i'm probably going backwards yeah and that's what i've learned probably through footy is the times where you think you're killing it you're probably not so I, I love being under pressure, but I don't like the feeling of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so that, that, so that is um, – so you've got to talk about stress. Some stress is really good for us. So you, that's a level of stress for you. So stress is not bad. So we need stress. If we don't have any stress at all, we're not developing, we're not getting any better. So we need some stress, but it's when it, when it gets too big, too much, too accumulative, much. just, yeah. you know. And that's just, when there's no plan. It just takes yeah. over, yeah. you know. So – but – you know, but pressure and stress is a construct in our own minds. So we create it. So what's stressful for you might be extremely stressful for me. It might not be stressful at all. And we tend to pass our own judgment on other. So I look at you and I think, really? You're worried about that? You're kidding yourself. Yeah. That's not a problem at all. Yet I've got something in my life and you look at me and think, God, oh, that guy's a fruitcake. You know, how could that possibly be stressful for him? So it really pressure and stress, we have control 
we control. We create our own story and then we run with it. And unless people challenge us on it, we just run we'll just run down a certain path. That could be a really positive path if it's, you know, we've got good stuff going on, but it could be a really negative path too, you know, if no one pulls us up on that story. Love it. Um, mate, to finish up, I want to talk about your opinion actually on this is obviously you've worked in a high performance environment for a very long time. Um, you, you've seen so many athletes and, and competitive people. And I think one thing we learned early on that Ben Crow said that I, I loved was an athlete isn't just someone who plays sport. It's someone who's just a competitive person. What are some of the best skills, personality traits that you see in successful people? What, what's something that you love when you see in people? You go, yeah, that guy will, or that, that guy or girl will, will be successful, whether it's sport or whether it's just life. And do you think they translate for athletes post footy? Um, yeah, I do. I do. And you know, the, the, probably the biggest thing you see, but also the research says, is that the good athletes and the good operators in anything just turn up. They turn up when they don't want to. They turn up when they're tired. They turn up when they're stressed. They turn up when they're frustrated. They turn up and they say, they have the ability to say, you know what, I might not be at my best today, but I'm still going to have a crack. And then I know that tomorrow is going to be a better day. They're, they're extremely optimistic and they think, you know what, this is going to be good for me. I'm going to find a way. They all have the same mentality of I'm going to find a way I'm having a bad day that's okay that's all part of the process I'm coming back tomorrow tomorrow's going to be a better day and that sounds they've got grit you know the Angela Duckworth great great book about grit you know it's just you know and the reason just keeps coming about it they just turn up and get on with the job and they know that if they're going to do it they're going to do it themselves and no one else is going to do it for them they're not relying on anyone else to do it for them except themselves Love it. Jack, uh, I honestly cannot thank you enough for your time, mate. It's been absolutely incredible. I've learned an absolute uh, a shit ton. I, I could have a year all day, um, but, but I won't. And, uh, yeah, I honestly can't thank you enough, mate, and, and best of luck. I know there's a lot more success coming your way. Um, I don't know what the stats are on high-performance directors' premierships, but I reckon you'd, you'd have to be up there. I'll have to fact-check that for next time. Maybe, but who cares? I care. Yeah. I, well, no, you well it's good for me because then I can say I had a 10 time high, <laughs> high performance director on the show you know it's it's good for me just worried about the next one yeah. don't worry about just worry about the next one <laughs> I love it mate thanks again thanks so much and uh, and best of luck cheers Dale good to be here enjoyed it